All right, this is a video that I have on screen here entitled An Arminian Error? Interrogative, question mark, from Leighton Flowers at Soteriology 101. And this is an excellent video that will establish the fact that Leighton Flowers and others like him are not Arminians. They are not Arminians, they are semi-Pelagians. They fall into the semi-Pelagian camp. So if you have Reformed Orthodoxy on the, on the far right, let's say, and you have full-blown Pelagianism on the far left, what you have are some in-between stuff, okay? A little bit more, a little left of Reformed Orthodoxy would be Arminianism, and then farther left of Arminianism would be semi-Pelagianism, and then you're way on the far left with full-blown Pelagianism. So Reformed Orthodoxy on the right, full-blown Pelagianism on the left, and then in between you have a little left of the Reformed Historic Orthodoxy, you have Arminianism, and then further left of that, of Arminianism, between Arminianism and full-blown Pelagianism, you have semi-Pelagianism. And here is the issue that that's differentiates between these groups, uh, between at least uh, the Reformed Calvinists versus Arminians versus semi-Pelagians. And if you watch this video all the way through, you will see that Leighton Flowers denies the Arminian view of what is called prevenient grace prevenient grace in Arminianism. So let's take a look here. I got a little I got some uh, some notes that I've taken here and written down. Calvinism versus Arminianism versus semi-Pelagianism or the quote traditionalism or quote provisionalism of people like Leighton Flowers or quote provisionalism if you want to call it that. They call themselves a few different labels but they do not like the label semi-Pelagianism even though it is an accurate historical label. Um, so Calvinism versus Arminianism versus semi-Pelagianism or traditionalism with respect to the grace of God in the salvation of sinners. That's the issue we're going to be talking about. This is the issue that really differentiates these groups. Calvinism versus Arminianism versus semi-Pelagianism is when we talk about the grace of God. And the question we are going to be asking is, what does God's grace effectuate in an unbelieving sinner? What does God's grace effectuate? Does it effectuate a change in the unbelieving sinner at all? That's what we want to ask. So let's go to Calvinistic or Reformed theology. We teach and promulgate that the grace of God as Calvinists actually effectuates a positive change in the fallen will of fallen man, that is unbelievers, so that, for the purpose that, they actually accept and believe the gospel proclamation concerning the Christ and cannot, that is, are unable to reject it as false. That's what God's grace does. It changes the will of man. It changes the heart of fallen man. It changes the mind of fallen man so that they are no longer unable to reject the gospel proclamation concerning the Christ as false. They can only accept it as true. This is a miraculous work of God. The Calvinistic or biblical view also teaches that saving faith is the gift of God infused into those whom he chooses by his grace alone. So, for example, the canons of the Synod of Dort were correct in stating that, quote, faith is therefore to be considered as the gift of God, not on account of its being offered by God to man to be accepted or rejected at his own pleasure, that is man's own pleasure, by his power of contrary choice, but because it is, in reality, conferred, breathed, and infused into him. Notice, faith is infused into him by the grace of God. Not because God bestows the power or ability to believe the power of contrary choice and then expects that man should, by the exercise of his own free will, as they define as the power of contrary choice, consent to the terms of salvation and actually believe in Christ, but because he who works in man both the will and to do, and indeed all things and all, produces, that is God, he produces both the will to believe and the act of believing also. He produces this by his grace. That's what God does. And that's from the third and fourth heads of doctrine of the corruption of man, his conversion to God, and the manner thereof, article 14 of the canons of the Synod of Dort. I highly recommend you read it. And this is the foundation of what we call sola gratia, Grace alone. Grace alone. You start, you start uh, chipping away at grace alone. You water it down as the Arminians do and as the semi-Pelagians do even more so than the Arminians and you've got problems in your theology. 
Only the Calvinists or Reformed uphold sola gratia to its highest uh, standard. Uh, in other words, in biblically derived Calvinism, God's grace is a powerful, miraculous work of God in an unbeliever, which carries with it, that is the grace of God, carries with it the gifts of repentance and faith, and that apart from God, by his grace, infusing saving faith into an unbeliever, the unbeliever cannot come to saving faith. They are unable to do so. Fallen man cannot conjure up saving faith within themselves, as both the Arminians and Semi-Pelagians must affirm. Um, Arminians and Semi-Pelagians must affirm that we conjure up saving faith within ourselves from the cauldron of man's human libertarian free will falsely defined as the power of contrary choice. Okay? But fallen mankind cannot conjure up saving faith within themselves as they have no power or ability to do so. Fallen man, being spiritual children of the wicked one, do not possess the power of contrary choice to either accept or reject the gospel as they so see fit. Fallen man only possesses the ability to reject the gospel as fallacious, not the ability to accept it as true. This is what Calvinists would refer to as the doctrine of irresistible grace, the I and the famous acronym TULIP, uh, also known as effectual unto salvation grace. It is That is, God's grace is actually effectual unto salvation. Man has no power of contrary choice in the matter. God takes over. In Arminian theology, however, the grace of God does actually effectuate a change in the fallen will of fallen man, insofar as God's grace frees the will of fallen man so that fallen man now possesses the power of contrary choice to either accept or reject the gospel proclamation concerning the Christ. See how that works? So in the Calvinistic view, grace actually carries with it the gifts of repentance and faith, where when it is bestowed, when God's grace is bestowed upon an unbeliever, they actually do believe and can't help but believe. They cannot reject it any longer. In Arminianism, however, the grace of God, the, what they call the prevenient grace of God, which simply means a grace that comes beforehand. And Calvinists believe in prevenient grace just as much as Arminians do. That is, a grace that comes beforehand. We just define it diff We define that prevenient grace differently than, Ar than Arminians. We're biblical. Arminians are very wishy-washy on it. But in Ar Arminian theology, the grace of God just frees the will. That is, gives man a free will so that he now has the power to either accept or reject the gospel proclamation. Okay, but he can still reject the gospel, even when provenient grace is given. The Calvinists say, no, this destroys the concept of the powerful, efficacious nature of grace. But before this prevenient grace changed the sinner's will to give him the power of contrary choice, the sinner did not possess it in and of himself. That is, um, the sinner was just as unable to accept the gospel as Calvinists assert. So again, historically, historically speaking, and there are Arminians who differ on this issue, but Historically, Arminians held to the same doctrine of total depravity as, of mankind as the Reformed or Calvinists did. And this is what <clears throat> this is one of the things Leighton Flowers will reject, of course, that uh, Arminians are too much in the Reformed camp with regard to the total depravity of man. Again, that makes him more semi-Pelagian than Arminian, Ar Arminian. It was the Arminian doctrine of the grace of God in salvation as well as unconditional election, limited atonement, or particular redemption, etc. But this was the big issue, the grace of God and salvation that separated them from the reform school of thought in issues of soteriology. It was the issue of God's grace in salvation. That was the big issue that uh, separated Calvinists from Arminians. Note that in historic Arminianism, the grace of God actually does effectuate a change in the unregenerate sinner just as much as in the Calvinistic reform teaching, though not in the same way, okay, obviously. In Arminianism, God's grace frees the will, giving man, fallen man, the power of contrary choice to either accept or reject. In Calvinism um, and the biblical uh, presentation, God's grace actually effectuates the change where faith is given as a gift of God, where they actually do believe and cannot reject the gospel. However, in Arminianism, God's grace is not effectual unto salvation. That's why I say irresistible grace should be called a uh, um, effectual unto salvation grace. Because in Arminianism, God's grace, prevenient grace, is not effectual unto salvation. Rather, it is only effectual unto freeing man's fallen will so that he now possesses the power of contrary choice to either accept or reject the gospel of Christ. 
what they fallaciously define as free will. Um, power of contrary choice or the equal ability to choose between two or more incompatible options under the same circumstance. But before this prevenient grace, fallen man did not possess the power of contrary choice. This freed will was a, uh, a gift of God's grace only when God chose to bestow it upon the individual, generally at the preaching of the gospel of Christ. So Arminian teacher Dr. Roger E. Olson writes in his book, Arminian Theology, Myths and Reality, quote, the intermediate stage between being unregenerate and regenerate is when the human being is not so much free to respond to the gospel as the semi-Pelagians claimed, and that's Leighton Flower's claim, he's a semi-Pelagian, but rather in the Arminian view, uh, the grace of God, he is the fallen man by the grace of God is freed to respond to the good news of redemption in Christ. Arminius thus believes not so much in a free will, but a freed will, a freed will, one which, though initially bound by sin, has been brought by the prevenient grace of the Spirit of Christ to a point where it can respond freely to the divine call. The soul of the sinner is being regenerated, but the sinner is able to resist and spurn the prevenient grace of God by denying the gospel. Again, God, by his prevenient grace, give, uh, frees the will, gives him a free will, where he now possesses the power of contrary choice to either accept or reject the gospel proclamation. Okay, and this is what Leighton Flowers uh, speaks out against. He says, "No, they're, they're, he denies the Arminian view of prevenient grace, and says, no, it's just the the what we call the general call of the gospel. That's grace enough. That's it." So we're going to go on to talk about the Arminian view of grace in a moment. But again, that's from Roger Olson's book, Arminian Theology, Myths and Reality, pages one sixty four to one sixty five. He's also citing wit in his book, Creation, Redemption, and Grace there. But what Dr. Olson, let's get back to Arminianism real quick, just a couple of things here. What Dr. Olson is saying is that only by the prevenient grace of God, uh, a grace that comes beforehand, does a sinner possess a freed will, the power of contrary choice, whereby they can either accept or reject the propositions of the gospel of Christ. Okay. Calvinists, Reformed, reject this doctrine of prevenient grace and insist rather that God's grace, when bestowed by him upon the sinner, actually results in the sinner's coming to saving faith in the gospel of Christ and cannot reject it, since saving faith is a gift of God's grace given discriminately to the elect alone. To the elect alone. And again, that's where all sinners just hate this doctrine, that God is in complete and utter control of every aspect of of a sinner's salvation. They hate this idea because most of them aren't universalists, which means that if God is in complete power and control over the salvation of sinners, means he has chosen not to, to save uh, many, uh, many uh, fallen sons and daughters of Adam, okay, because they will be destroyed in the lake of fire, which of course God is not obligated to save any, anyone, okay? But Arminianism still leaves the ultimate decision to man, whether he will or will not come to saving faith. Thus, in Arminianism, faith is not a gift of God's grace, but something man must conjure up within himself. Okay, Again, the conjuring up of faith from the cauldron of man's own human libertarian free will, the power of contrary choice. This is what the Reformed absolutely deny and reject. Semi-Pelagianism sometimes referred to by Leighton Flowers and others as traditionalism or provisionalism. Some refer to it as a extensivism, etc., etc. It is just nothing but good old, warmed over, semi-Pelagianism. That's all it is. Unlike Calvinism and Arminianism, the semi-Pelagianism of the traditionalist states that the grace of God is not, not an effectual work of God. Notice, unlike Calvinism and Arminianism, in Arminianism, God's grace actually does and completes an effectual work in the will, heart, mind of man, a fallen man. In Calvinism, it most certainly does an effectual work in the heart, mind, will of man, but not in semi-Pelagianism. Okay? Rather, the gospel proclamation itself is the grace of God, but it doesn't actually effectuate any change in the will of the person, they possess the power of contrary choice, just like they did before they heard the gospel, they do after they hear the gospel, and when they hear the gospel. To these traditionalists, fallen children of Adam possess the power of contrary choice when they hear the gospel, not by God's grace, as in Arminianism, but because it is inherent in them. Man never lost this power of contrary choice as a result 
of the fall. Now, let me give a little caveat here because some semi-Pelagians traditionalists might argue against this. Having said this, these traditionalists often speak inconsistently respecting this issue. They will often use confusing doublespeak, saying one thing and then saying the complete opposite thing in the next sentence. They are inconsistent because they are confused. These are confused people, the traditionalists like Leighton Flowers and others. And notice now, let me give an example of this. Uh, this quotation from a traditionalist author, a neo-semi-Pelagian. This is from the book, Anyone Can Be Saved, a defense of, quote, traditional, end quote, Southern Baptist soteriology. This is a defense of the, quote, traditionalist statement of faith um, by some Southern Baptists who have uh, had a bunch of people sign it and whatnot. This is a semi-Pelagian document, by the way. Historically, it will be known as a semi-Pelagian document. So this is from Dr. Brad Reynolds on page 72. He writes, it seems that God created people with the ability to trust. Okay, Adam and Eve with the ability to trust. The ability to trust, believe, exercise faith was not lost in the fall. Notice that, not lost in the fall. This goes against Arminianism and this goes against uh, historic Reformed Orthodoxy or Calvinism. Okay, This is why these people are semi-Pelagians and not Arminians. The ability to trust, believe, exercise faith was not lost in the fall. Dr. Reynolds is saying that the power of contrary choice, what synergists fallaciously refer to as free will, was not lost after the fall of Adam, and that's semi-Pelagianism. That is a semi-Pelagian view. But notice now the doublespeak and the confusion that comes with it. Dr. Reynolds continues, but the ability to trust was so twisted by the fall that we are now unable to trust in God without the grace of God. Unable to trust. Okay, so right here, we have this, the ability to trust, believe, exercise faith was not lost in the fall. And here we have that ability was so twisted by the fall that we are now unable to trust in God without the grace of God. And we'll get into the without the grace of God statement in a moment. So notice the confusion there. Uh, it, the, the ability to believe was not lost in the fall, but it was so twisted that we are now unable to trust. Okay, So which is it? Either in the fall, mankind did not lose his ability to trust, or man did lose it and is now unable to trust. The words unable, inability, and ability mean opposite things. They are antonymous terms. They are antonyms. Dr. Reynolds doesn't seem to know that these words are antonyms. Dr. Reynolds is, of course, breaking the law of contradiction and logic, namely, that A cannot be both A and not A at the same time, and is stating that rather A can be both A and not A at the same time. This is illogical and this is nonsense. This is utter confusion. This is why those in the semi-Pelagian or traditionalist camp are not only confused themselves, but are also confusing others with their confusing language. But let's look at the entire statement and add a few more by this confused author, Dr. Brad Reynolds, again, writing in the um, semi-Pelagian traditionalist defense book, Anyone Can Be Saved. He writes, it seems that God created people with the ability to trust, okay? That's, we'll say, Adam and Eve in their creation, okay? That ability was not lost in the fall, but that ability was so twisted by the fall that we are now unable. Ability was not lost, but now unable. Again, total confusion. We are now unable to trust in God without the grace of God. Okay, let's go on. He gives this grace to all men. And of course, what does he mean by that? Every single individual human being without exception. That's not what the Bible means by all men. But these folks see all men as, and every single, they define it as every single individual human being without exception. But this grace can be resisted. But if the grace of God is given to every single human being without exception, this is what is, he means by all men, then why does he then say this grace can be resisted? If, this, if grace is given and, <clears throat> and efficacious to give every single individual human being without exception the ability to trust in God, then there is no one who is not able to trust in God. Hence, there is no such thing as anyone who is unable to trust in God. Okay? And that goes against both Arminians and, of course, the Reformed, Orthodox Reformed folks, Calvinists. So according to our confused friend, Dr. Reynolds, 
fallen man is now a, unable to trust in God without the grace of God. And since God gives this grace to every single individual human being without exception, therefore no one is unable to trust in God because the grace of God is given to every single individual human being without exception, giving them all the ability to trust in God. In other words, there is no one who doesn't possess the power of contrary choice to either accept or reject the gospel of Christ when they hear it. Semi-Pelagians believe in the universal free will of man as in the power of contrary choice to come to saving faith in the gospel of Christ. This is, again, just a form of synergism. Two or more working, sin and ergon. Sin, ergon, that's two or more working. Two or more working God and man. Arminians believe that free will is only given to those to whom God bestows prevenient grace, and as a result, they must still exercise their power of contrary choice to come to saving faith in the gospel of Christ. Both these systems, closely related as they are, are forms of what is known as synergism. And of course, Calvinists believe that God's grace carries with it the gifts of repentance and faith, and that all those upon whom God bestows his grace do actually come to saving faith in the gospel. God alone working the salvation and fallen man, including the infusing of saving faith into them. That is what is known as monergism, mana or mono, one ergon, working, one working, okay? That is, God alone works salvation. And because of all this confusion, the Calvinist is, is left asking the all-important question, what does God's grace effectuate in a sinner? What does God's grace effectuate in a sinner? That is an important question. Both Calvinists and historic Arminians hold the, to the proposition that God's grace has an effect upon the will of fallen man. That is, that God's grace actually effectuates a change in the will of the sinner. The semi-Pelagian does not believe this. Unless, again, they want to try and argue against this, and I'll leave that to them. They can post their comments down below or whatnot. Um, just a quick note here. As much as Arminians argue against what Calvinists refer to as irresistible grace, they have unwittingly and ignorantly affirmed it. They, they, Arminians actually affirm irresistible grace by their doctrine of prevenient grace. It's just that for the Arminians, this grace is not efficacious unto salvation. But it does effectuate a change in them that they can't help but be changed and given a free will by the prevenient grace of God. They can't reject the fact that they have a free will by God's prevenient grace. Okay, they can reject the gospel or accept the gospel with that, quote, free will that is given by prevenient grace. But the prevenient grace itself actually effectuated a work in them. So, again, Arminians who try to attack irresistible grace, I'm like, you guys have just as much an irresistible grace as the Calvinists do. It's just that the Calvinists say the grace of God is efficacious unto salvation and you deny that. Um in Arminianism, as well as with semi-Pelagianism, it is up to the individual to conjure up saving faith within themselves. For the Calvinist, God's grace actually effectuates the salvation of a sinner. It does not merely potentially do so and then leave it up to the sinner to conjure up faith within themselves by their power of contrary choice. The Reformation motto, sola gratia, is most accurately represented by the Calvinist reform system. While in the Arminian and semi-Pelagian systems, it must be grace plus something done by the man, namely the conjuring up of faith. For the Arminian, God's grace only potentially saves a sinner, but only if they accept the gospel after prevenient grace is bestowed, giving them the power of contrary choice. They can just as well reject the gospel, though. They retain the right of refusal, in other words, which is from um, a good book that I have. Uh, what is it? Whosoever, the Whosoever uh, He Wills book, and it's up on my shelf somewhere. Anyway, I don't want to really take too much time to look for it. Whos, whosoever He Wills. Mm. But anyway, one of the authors used that term, uh, to retain the right of refusal. I thought that was a really good way to put it. Uh, and I should have had the quote up here, so I apologize for that. For the semi-Pelagian, God's grace doesn't effect, effectuate any change in the sinner. But the sinner possesses the power of contrary choice to accept or reject the gospel when they hear it, apart from any effectual work of God's grace upon their wills. Okay, This is an important issue because it will affect the Christian's thanksgiving and worship of God. 
Semi-Pelagians can't give thanks the way I, as a Calvinist, can give thanks to God. Semi-Pelagians can't worship and reverence God in the same way that I worship and reverence God because he brought me into his family by his powerful, efficacious grace alone. I didn't, And the faith that I have is not mine own. It was given to me by God. Okay, The semi-Pelagian can't say that. Theology matters because one's theology affects their doxology, their worship. Doxa meaning worship, praise, or reverence for God. So theology matters because theology affects doxology. Theology affects also thanksgiving to God. That's why theology matters. And indeed, uh, I think this is my last quotation. John Calvin rightly stated, we shall never feel persuaded as we ought that our salvation flows from the free mercy of God as its fountain until we are made acquainted with his eternal election. The grace of God being illustrated by the contrast, namely, that he does not adopt all promiscuously to the hope of salvation, but gives to some what he denies to others. It is plain how greatly ignorance of this principle detracts from the glory of God and impairs true humility on the part of the Christian. Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 3, Chapter 21, Section 1, Brackets Mine. Um, Calvin understood this. Calvin understood that the grace of God and salvation, efficacious unto salvation as it is, uh, if people are ignorant of this fact, it detracts from the glory of God, and it impairs their own humility. They think they're humble, and in fact, it impairs true humility. Okay, he recognized the importance of all this. Um, the grace of God is an important biblical doctrine, of course, and one that should lead any true Christian to reverence for God and thanksgiving to him for it, for their salvation stems from it alone, grace alone, sola gratia. Let's see if I have anything else. Nope, sola gratia. That should be it. Uh, questions, comments, post them down below. I think the camera got stuck on me, but... Uh, we should, I think, I think we have everything in there. Um, let me know what you're thinking about all that. Talk to you soon. Soli Deo Gloria.